So, if I make the statement to you that we are to have the mind of Christ, does that seem, does that seem like an unreachable thing? Can we have the mind of Christ? Do you think that is, is something that a lot of people give thought to? I'm talking church people. Or do you think more people are imagining some sort of separation that says Jesus is over here and I'm over here and the idea of having the mind of Christ is just something more than I can handle. Some people would even say, oh, that's, that's terrible to say such a thing. How could we say we could have the mind of Christ? You know, when Jesus came to this earth and born in a legal way, he came into this world the same way that you and I did. His parentage was a little different. Being the son of God. But he, he came to this earth being born in a natural way. And he was born as a baby. And even people who don't follow Jesus at this time of the year. Ooh and ah. And you think about Christmas and you think about the kids and little babies. And we see a baby in a manger. Oh, isn't that sweet? But you know, that baby in the manger at this point in time couldn't speak. Because when Christ came to this earth, he was fully God, but he limited himself by being born as a human being. That he was fully God, but he was fully man, which means that he limited himself to being human. But as that baby grew and learned how to speak and started speaking publicly, all of a sudden, people got hung up on some of the things he said. And the longer he was in his earthly ministry, the, the more complicated his sayings became. And, and the less he spoke plainly, the more he spoke, he spoke in parables and he spoke some mysteries. Because there has to be a, a, a desire in the heart of people who really want to follow Jesus. They have to be hungry. And so Jesus, when he taught, he taught with some mystery. Because if there's some mystery, you have to invest yourself into finding out some of these answers. And I'm going to tell you it's the same way today. If there isn't some mystery, you're, you, there's, there's less uh, encouragement to dig deeper. And he wants us to dig deeper, always. He wants us to go deeper. Uh, if, if you're looking for a place where we come in here and go through a predictable order of things and, you know, it ain't going to happen because it's not about what we go through. Now, we all have customs and traditions, and that's fine. <clears throat> we all have religion to a sense. We, have, we knew to show up here this morning, right? There are some good habits to have. But the way we approach Jesus should, just should not be religious. It should not be going through the motions. We are designed to have the mind of Christ. I want to do something a little different this morning, and don't get scared. Uh, none of you have to get up here. Just go, <coughs> okay. <coughs> but I do want to look at three passages of Scripture to kind of bring out this whole idea of having the mind of Christ. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, then we should have a good understanding of Jesus. And the first thing that we have to understand is that the Son always existed. Jesus the man did not, but the Son always existed. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, pre-existent. Nobody created them. Our finite minds have trouble with that unless you're really, really sharp. I have trouble with eternity past. I don't have so much trouble with eternity future. But eternity past, before anything existed, God. So, I want to look at the first five verses of the book of Genesis this morning. And you have heard this uh, before, reading it in the NLT just to, 
kind of maybe make it sound a little bit different. I'd encourage you to follow along. We are going to go to three different places. One in the Old Testament at the very beginning. Pretty easy to find Genesis 1-1, right? Uh, <laughs> well, most of us, Michelle, anyway. <clears> then <throat> we're going to be going to two places in the New Testament. So, first five verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And right off the bat, we have two out of the three members of the Godhead. In the beginning, God and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, hovered over the waters. Then God said, remember that word, said, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, that he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. So God spoke into existence that which did not exist before. He, he didn't have to take any raw materials. He just spoke. Let there be light. And there was light. If you, if you trace the theory of evolution back, you always come back to a question. And the question is this. Where did the raw materials come from? And we have the answer in Genesis. God spoke. And we know that through the, the six days of creation that he spoke the world and its inhabitants into existence. Life came because God spoke. So I want us to look at the first five verses of another book. Chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. And you certainly are going to hear some very familiar language compared to the first five verses of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The first five verses of John's Gospel. John, right off the bat, makes it very clear who the Word is, and that Word is Jesus. He goes on further to say that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, that of the only glory of the, of the begotten of the Father, the only one, the only Son of God. In the beginning, God created by speaking, there's Jesus. There's the Son. The Word, Lagos, is the, the spoken Word. In the beginning, the Son existed. In the beginning, Lagos existed. Tells us that Jesus is God. Tells us that Jesus is the Son of God. Tells us that the Word became flesh. Jesus is also man. He's the Son of man. So there are times when we read through the Gospels that Jesus refers to himself in the third person. Sometimes he calls himself Son of God. Sometimes he says Son of Man. He's both. <clears throat> and in that state that he took upon, there is such humiliation. Do you know what I mean? There's humiliation in the fact that God became a man. The Creator became like his creation. He had to be completely God or else his life would not have been sufficient in its sacrificial act on Calvary. If he wasn't man, then he could not die to pay the penalty of sin. If he wasn't God, 
He could not be holy. He could not be sinless so that that sacrifice would mean something. Fully God, fully man. The Son, preexistent with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit, before the earth was ever created. And in those first five verses of Genesis, when it says, and God spoke, the spoken word is logos. And that spoken word in the right time and the right place became a man. This is what we call the incarnation. And you hear about that at this time of year. But I wonder sometimes if we understand, first of all, the humility that it took for the perfect God to take on flesh and bone and blood. His light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. There is no dark, dark enough to extinguish the light. So we get an idea. (coughs) Jesus is God. God did not cease being in his heaven when Jesus came to earth. Nor did God cease to be in his heaven when the Holy Spirit was sent following the ascension of Jesus. It's this three-part mystery that we have to give ourselves some time to understand. One God, eternally existent in three persons. That's this concept called the Trinity. And our finite minds cannot fully understand this. But here's what we can understand. The whole idea of the incarnation, the fact that the Word, the spoken Word of God, became flesh. And when he walked on this earth, he didn't walk around totally uh, immune from all of the stuff that we go through, quite the opposite. He suffered more than any of us here. First of all, he suffered in the fact that this holy God had to walk in flesh. And you know what that meant? That meant that he could be tempted. If Christ could not be tempted... He would not have been God in the flesh. If Christ couldn't be tempted, his sacrificial death on Calvary, the blood sacrifice that he made, could not pay for sin because he would not have been able to understand sin. I think it's really good for us to go back to some of this Jesus 101 kind of stuff at this time of the year because I am fully convinced having been in ministry for almost 40 years and been to thousands, literally thousands of churches and stood at this end of the building talking to different people. I'm fully convinced that there are people who go to church every Sunday and don't get this. Because they think of, well, you know, Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, yeah, if I say the right words, uh, whatever, I'm just going to try to be good. And I don't think they get it. I don't think they get it. What it means that, that God became a man. The incarnation, I don't think a lot of people get it. This is why Jesus is the only way. There's no other human being that ever walked the face of the earth that had the qualifications of Jesus because in heaven, before time began, the Son was. That's why he is the only way. We're not being mean to other religions. There's one God. One God created everything we see and don't see. There's one son, and he came to earth 2,000 years ago, became a baby, grew up to be a man, was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. So what what a humiliating experience for Jesus. How humiliating. The father says, son, I'm gonna gonna send you down to earth, but I'm not gonna send you, I'm not gonna send an angel. I'm not going to somehow send you fully grown. I'm not going to just send you maybe with your voice to proclaim the truth. I'm going to send you as one of them. Oh, and by the way, you're going to experience pain. 
you're going to experience loss. You're going to experience temptation. You're going to experience struggle. You're going to be cold. You're going to be hot. You're going to be hungry. Oh, and by the way, even though you don't deserve to, you're going to die. That's why Jesus is the only way. That's why our hearts should break when we get into these awful discussions. How can you say Jesus is the only way? Because he's the only one who was ever qualified. Show me these kind of qualifications from any other good teacher. It doesn't knock the other teachers. You know, God has put people in place who were very bright and had very good insight. But we don't follow them. We don't worship them. They didn't give their life for you. They didn't defeat death by rising again. They're not coming back. Now, getting a little bit of the concept here of how Christ humiliated himself, can we take it a step further? <coughs> Philippians 2. Philippians 2. We're going to look at verses 5 through 11. A whole lot of, whole lot of Scripture today. I hope that's okay. We're in church. Uh, <laughs> Man, if I had to just base it on what I thought and what I believed, we'd be in trouble. <clears throat> this informs our beliefs, not our emotions. Yeah. This informs our beliefs, yeah. not the kind of day we're having. Yes. Your bank account just should not inform your beliefs. This should. Amen. Amen. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Ah, here we go. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. <coughs> the Apostle Paul got a hold of something here. This, this book called Philippians that he wrote from prison And it wasn't our kind of prisons, right? It was smelly and dark and damp and yucky. That's the Greek, yucky. Yeah. But man, oh man, did he get a hold of something. And I want us to walk through this kind of slow. Have this mind among yourselves. Yes, we are intended to have the mind of Christ. Right there. It's not unapproachable. It's as close, right? Jesus is as close as the mention of his name. He's closer than you could even imagine. We walk around in flesh, and sometimes it clouds our perception. In the person of the Holy Spirit, right here. And what does Paul say to the Philippian church, and what does he say to us today? Have this mind among yourselves. That means think about this. Think about this. Have this mind among yourselves. Can I suggest to you that that's what it means to follow Jesus? It doesn't mean say some prayer and show up in a church building once in a while. All those things are fine. It doesn't mean to sing the right songs and just to come and worship. That's all fine too. Have this mind in yourself. That is exactly what it means to follow Jesus. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to know what he thinks about things and then do the same. And I say today, it's possible. Okay, we're not going to be perfect. I get it. Like I've said many times, most of the time when you say, well, nobody's perfect, you set out right away to prove it. So let's not say nobody's perfect. Of course they're not. But can we focus on the one who is perfect? Have this mind among yourselves. Think about this. And, and, think, and here's the rest of it. Which is yours in Christ Jesus? 
That means if you're a believer and you're a follower of Jesus, that mind of Christ, it's yours. It's yours. You may have not apprehended it yet, but it's yours. You know the, the bracelets that people wore, big phrase, what would Jesus do, WWJD? How about what would Jesus think? WWJT doesn't flow off the tongue quite as well, but what would Jesus think? I think that because the thought's where it starts, isn't it? What would Jesus think? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, we just spent an awful lot of time saying he was God. God in the flesh. He existed before the world began. Before the Logos, the Word, proclaimed Word, came forth from God that created everything. Before any of that, He existed. So, here, here's what we keep in mind, the mind of Christ. Though He was in the form of God, He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's it's an interesting phrase, right? And different translations treat it differently. And, and there are some who look at, I think the King James says, uh, thought it not robbery to cling to this fact. So, on one hand, we can say, well, he didn't think that it was improper for him to claim to be God. But then the other translation says he didn't count that equality as something to hang on to. I think it's both. He certainly had no problem. He knew who he was. Jesus knew who he was. If you don't think that, you haven't read the Gospels. He knew who he was. But he didn't count that as something to hang on to. He was willing to let go of that. Wow. Another humbling. Not only did he become a man, not only did God take on flesh, he humbled himself, knowing full well who he was, but said, you know what? I'm not going to claim my rights. That's why Jesus isn't real popular. Because everyone's about their rights. And here it says, have the same mind as is yours in Christ Jesus. That means think like Jesus. So we're getting started. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. How did he do that? He on purpose restricted himself by flesh and bone. In, 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 the, in the grand plan before the foundation of the earth, God had Jesus in mind. He emptied himself. It doesn't mean he stopped being God. But it did mean that he subjected himself to all of the things that us flesh and blood and bone people are subjected to. Talk about humility. Taking the form of a servant. It gets worse. It gets more demeaning. It's one thing for him to walk around in flesh and bone. Now he's taken the form of a servant, a doulos. It's a, a bond slave. Someone who sells themselves to be a servant to others. Think about it. Would you want to sell yourself to be a servant to others? If you have the mind of Christ, that's what we're called to do. This is called following Jesus. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself again by becoming obedient to the point of death. Stop there for a minute. Being found in human form, first humble. He humbled himself, second humble. He became obedient to the point of death, third humbling. But doesn't stop there. Even death on a cross. Four humbling actions right in a row, right within that verse. He became a man. He became obedient. He became a slave. He died on a cross. The cross was reserved for the most harsh punishment. This was, on, this was reserved for the worst criminals. 
the worst criminals. And here he is, who did no wrong, convicted by men, religious men, of a crime that was so great that it required crucifixion. And he did this for you. And he did this for me. And we are to have the mind of Christ. Wow. What, what do we have to empty ourselves of to have that? Keeps a lot of people from following Jesus. Keeps a lot of people from understanding the joy of following Jesus. You follow up to a certain point. Well, I don't know. I'm pretty good at doing this. I really can't let that go. What would people think if, if I lowered myself to serve other people the way Jesus did? It's that, that's a humbling thing. Man. The flesh doesn't like to be humble. Huh? The flesh doesn't like to be humble. That's why we have to crucify the flesh. Galatians 2.20, right? Again, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ who lives in me. <clears throat> Verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name is above every name. God is going to give us a new name too. It will not be a name that is above every other name. But the, the fact is, if we have the mind of Christ and we humble ourselves to the point of emptying ourselves of everything that is us and taking on everything that God has for us, we will be exalted in due time. We just got to stop worrying about when that's going to happen. It may not happen in this life, but we will be exalted in due time. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Here we have some imagery that in the Greco-Roman culture of the day, this would have been something that the Greeks would talk about. When they talk about something being all-encompassing, they would, they would use a phrase like this. They would say, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. It means everywhere, in every dimension, in every a uh, spiritual category, every facet of human time. It means everywhere, not leaving anything out. Every knee should bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. There is going to come a time that all will acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Amen. Unfortunately, for some, it will be too late. It's only my second cough drop of the day. I'm feeling pretty good. Wow. <laughs> I'm not doing pretty good. Jesus is. The one creator, the only way. That little baby grew. That little baby started out in his ministry having a lot of people for him. And pretty soon, he revealed what it really means to follow Jesus. And he had more people fall away. Mm -hmm. So, if following Jesus, if you think it's going to make you popular, you need to rethink. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we have to be nasty or miserable to people, although a lot of church people have done that doesn't mean it's following Jesus, but you take a stand. There are things you cannot allow in your life. There are things that you have to allow in your life if you're going to have the mind of Christ, if you're going to follow Jesus. So, kind of distilled this down to four things that we can take from this that we can actually apply. I mean, we hear talk like this, and we understand the, the doctrine and the theology behind it, and hopefully we have a better idea of how Jesus came to earth, the credentials he came with, the, the willingness he had to let all of those go for you and for me. How do we take this knowing that we are meant to have the mind of Christ? How do we take this and walk with it? Well, I think a couple ways. The first is this, deny yourself. What does that mean? 
maybe what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you have to beat yourself with sticks and wear sackcloth and ashes and decide that you're not going to enjoy your life. There are some people that here deny yourself and right away they say, that's too much for me. I'm too important. Uh, after all, don't you know who I am, right? Denying yourself in terms of having the mind of Christ means this. He calls the shots. When God leads you, when God calls you, you don't have the right to say no. You have every right to say, I don't quite understand. Don't you think sometimes that's okay? That, that God says, come ask me questions. I want you to understand. Denying ourselves means that there are many different roads that you can take in this life and you could make something of yourself. Uh, you could become famous. You could become rich. Uh, you be, could become popular. You could be an influencer in our day and age and, and be all about you because people who live by the flesh love to watch other people who live by the flesh. And Jesus says, that isn't the way for you. Deny all of that and follow me. How many here can say that you found a better life when you denied all that other stuff that the world looks for and you said, I'm following Jesus. Amen. Huh? It, we're, we're not, he's not out to cramp your style. He's out to give you a better life than anything you could have come up with on your own. And you'll have peace at night when you lay your head on the pillow. Amen. Let's look at the second thing that we can do to really make this apply. Go ahead, bring it up. I'm leaving my notes. Empty yourself. I want to get the order right. Empty yourself of what? Self. Mm -hmm. Pride. Yes. If we deny ourselves to do the things that the, that the unbelieving world wants to do, well, then we have to empty, or empty ourselves of pride. We have to empty ourselves of our own personal gain. And when we empty ourselves of us, Guess what that makes more room for? <laughs> the Holy Spirit. And that's why we say we need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We need to be overflowed. We, we need to be like someone just sitting in a great big pool of Holy Spirit. <laughs> Through us, over us, around us. Because that's where the power is. That's where the power for serving is. That's where the power for witnessing is. And too many times, I love the one of these days I might find a track for it and sing it. There's a song called Empty Hands. And the, line, the last line of the song is, How could God pour his riches into hands already full? Oh, God, bless me. Oh, God, do this. He wants to. But first you've got to empty yourself of you. And here's the third thing we can do. See yourself. This is important. So when we speak deny yourself, empty yourself, if we're not careful, that creates a very negative connotation. I have to give up what I want to do. Does that mean I can't have fun? Um, does that mean I can't ever eat ice cream again? Does that mean that I can't laugh? Does that mean that I can't go on vacation? Does that mean I can't have a hobby? Does that mean blah, 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 blah? Not at all. Because in this, it's important to see yourself as God sees you. As God sees you. This, this walk of humility, look at Jesus. Look at the way he lived his life. He was not lacking in confidence. People didn't walk over him. He didn't say, oh, well, it's just not about this. It's, he knew who he was. Now, we're not Jesus, but we are children of God if we're born again. That spirit deep inside of us has been changed. Someday... When we see him face to face, the Bible says we shall be like him. So we need to start thinking like him. See yourself as who God made you to be. In and of myself, I can't do anything. But with Christ, anything is possible. Amen. I can walk confidently forward into that which God is calling me to do. I can take authority over sickness and disease in my life. I can take authority 
over evil spirits. We don't have to be like, like afraid of a ghost or something going to jump out and say boo. And we recognize that there are those spirits in the earth. But we are to discern the difference between the, the spirit of evil and the spirit of God. And if you spend any time at all here and here and on your knees, it's not that big of a deal. You recognize it. It's just not that difficult. You recognize the source and where it's coming from. Take people out of the mix. It's not that person that's against you. It's not your place in society that's against you. You're a child of God. And there's a, there's a confidence that we have to walk in. It's also accompanied by humility that says, I'm not all that. Amen. But because of Jesus, I'm a child of God. Amen. I heard somebody speak in a sermon not too long ago. I thought it was really funny. Said, you can, over, you can be overly humble. Like somebody sings a song in church and they say, that was great. Oh, that was just God. And he says, well, it wasn't that good. I mean, if it was God, it would have really been something. So it, it's not demeaning yourself. It's not, it's not beating yourself up. It's understanding who you are in Christ. And with the humility that says, without Christ, I would be nothing. And here's the fourth thing that I want us to remember. Give yourself. Huh? Now that you're, you've denied the way the world operates, even though it sometimes looks good, and we can say, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm just going to go live like everybody else. Look at them. They got all the money. They got all the toys. Uh, they just do whatever they want. They go out and party and they don't worry about this, you know, guilty conscience about things. You deny yourself of the world. You empty yourself of you. Then you see yourself as who God made you and give yourself. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Making disciples. Huh? This is what we're made to do. This is the heart of God. This is the mind of Christ. Give yourself for other people. Even the people that make you mad. Even the people that make fun of you for your decision to follow Jesus. Jesus had a heart for people like that, didn't he? He spent more time uh, speaking against the people that thought themselves to be righteous on their own. He spent less time humiliating people who were already in sin. He had more time for them than he did for the self-righteous. Right. One of these days I'm going to work on it. I've got some uh, graphics, and I'm going to make a graphic that says Pharisee-free zone. Yes. Kind of like the, uh, the uh, what's the, d downtown here? Uh, uh, Shan uh, huh? Planet Fitness. Yeah, use the Planet Fitness stuff. I didn't say that out loud. Don't worry, I'm not going to avoid any copyrights. Um, and instead of judgment-free zone, it's going to be Pharisee-free zone. No self-righteousness allowed. Confidence in Christ, yes, all day long. We are not meant to live in fear. Have the mind of Christ. Yeah, we can. This scripture in Philippians 2 tells us that we are made to have the mind of Christ. And I say it again. This is what it really means to follow Jesus. Have the mind of Christ. If someone asks you, are you a follower of Jesus? And I, I kind of like that better even than Christian. Because Christians become an adjective. We have Christian everything. Since when could anybody but a person be a Christian? Christian television, Christian music, Christian movies, Christian this, Christian that. And maybe we spend a little less time segmenting ourselves and just got into the world and influenced the world the way Jesus expects us to and give ourselves to a world that is lost needs to hear about Jesus. They need to know what happened when that baby grew up that baby that they're talking about, even the people who don't even believe in him, know that this is about the birth of Jesus, that he was a baby. Maybe they don't know anything more. You can tell them, let me tell you something. 
I know the mind of Christ because that's how God intended me to live. And let me explain what it means to follow Jesus. If every person who claimed to be a Christian followed Jesus, we would have nonstop revival. Hallelujah. Nonstop. <clears throat> because following Jesus comes down to the way you live your life. It comes down to not living in sin when he told you not to. It comes down to obeying what he told you to do. It comes down to taking him in his word as truth and walking in it. It doesn't mean you understand it all. It doesn't mean that it's always going to be pleasant. But he's given us plenty of guidelines in his word to know what he expects of us. And first and foremost, today anyway, it is to have the mind of Christ. Amen. What would Jesus think in any given situation? What would Jesus think? What would he do? What decision would he make? How would he live? What choices would he make? What would he give his time and allegiance to? What would Jesus think? We're intended to have the mind of Christ.